Hello, today I'm going to be doing a teardown of the Spigen 100 watt USB-C power adapter. So there's already a video for this thing for the power performance, which wasn't very good. And also there's the discrete lack of safety listings on the side of this. When we take a look inside, we'll see if there's any issues with safety like clearances and things like that. Just for a quick recap, here's the data that we captured from this power adapter. We can see it's really not very good, especially for that 100 watt class device. And, and looking at it on a graph, you can see it's far lower than a lot of the competition. So I've done a whole bunch of these teardowns. I'll link some in, but let's get into it. Let's see how easy it is to get in there. Well, I got a little bit of a glimpse inside. Not very easy to get into this one. All right, we're in. You can see they used the wiring technique to get over to the mains plugs. So they did something a little unique with this power adapter and they have it wrapped up in this foil right here. This is probably for EMI protection. So this is to help some of the noise that breaks out from these things when they're sitting there doing their switching thing. They also have this uh, carbon film on here. I wonder if that's conductive. Doesn't look like it, but the copper sure should be conductive. Very conductive. Looks like they actually have this one soldered in place. We'll cut that out. Bed on the bottom. Kind of a weird, it's pretty dense foam material. Assuming this is heat transfer too. Well, there's one thing about this teardown is definitely more messy than the other teardowns have been because it's got this weird sticky foam stuff in it. And it's very annoying to work with. You can see some part number down here. They say mark it up to about 100 watts. And one of the things we can see from the top side is there's two transformers. You can see there is a little piece of plastic. So there's some attempt to keep these two sides isolated. But on the bottom we have two identical bridge rectifiers. And they're, they're basically just feeding two identical circuits. So you have three capacitors and three capacitors. There's a little capacitor down there for like support circuitry and we'll see two sets of diodes and things here to pull power from the auxiliary winding of the transformer so you can see four wires right here and two wires over here and a single chip here leading me to believe that this is a conventional flyback converter but it's actually two flyback converters on the same board this is a crazy integrated chip though it kind of has like everything all in one chip these are just your standard bridge rectifiers over here so these are converting the AC to DC which is charging up these filter capacitors right here. One of the things we don't see on this board, and it was one of the things I was hoping would be on this board, is power factor correction. And there is no presence of any circuitry that would indicate that it has power factor correction. You can see the keep out zone here across the two sides is, is not too bad. On the input side, the neutral comes in, it goes through a negative temperature coefficient resistor right here. So this will become less resistive as it's turned on. So initially it'll have a high resistance and then as you pull current through it, it'll actually decrease in resistance. This is important because you have this giant bank of capacitors right here, which means this thing's going to have a huge inrush current. Looks like that says five amps, 250 volts for the fuse. We have an input common mode choke. We have a input suppression capacitor and then another input common mode choke. And that's before the bridge rectifier. We do see 105 degrees C rated capacitors. Not sure of the brand. Looks like a couple different brands. Chang and Aishi. But in terms of topology, it's just a standard flyback converter. I want to see if these capacitors are connected together. So it looks like at least on this side, they are not directly connected with each other. So on the ground side, they are directly connected to each other. I don't know if they had any claim of GAN on this. I don't know if this has any kind of GAN in it. We'll have to check the data sheet for this. All right, so I went and did a little research on this chip, this INN3379C, and it is exactly what I said. It's a flyback converter chip with integrated optocoupler and everything, so it's got high isolation between the two sides. And it looks like this chip is a, does have some kind of type approvals, so it you know could meet safety ratings if required. And I found a, a demo sheet of all this stuff and everything on here is exactly per the, the recommendation for this chip and it's just multiplied by two. They literally just put two of the same circuit down on the board. Everything's identical. 
and then there's a little protocol chip right here from the same company. And these, these, these guys actually recommend this chip to go with that to control everything. These chips technically can do in a power adapter configuration, something like 60 watts or 65 watts each. That's not too bad. And they have like a 0.35 uh, ohm MOSFET in them. So they can do some switching. It switches around 140 kilohertz. So nothing crazy or groundbreaking compared with some of the more modern technologies like the GAN switchers that are out there. This is just a very bog standard power adapter with two glommed together power adapters to get the 100 watts out. I really need to do the video on how I modified these calipers. All right, so there we can see we got about 8.9 millimeters clearance between these components. That's acceptable. Here's the same distance with our suppression capacitor. Still talking about eight millimeters with the suppression capacitor, so no problems there. So it's definitely got the separation between the two sides of the boards. So they're meeting the requirements, at least on this side of the board, but then we're going to have to pop these transformers off the board and explore a little more to, to get the full picture with this one. You can see they do have some markings on the side of the transformer. All right, so on the top side of the board, little traces that poke in inside that boundary. So we're still talking about seven millimeters or so on the top side of the board between the two different sides. So you got plenty, plenty of separation. So between the two sides of the boards, you can see that there's no traces. All you have between the two sides of the boards is that chip. And you can see both of them right through the board. So that's good. We definitely have some good isolation between the two sides. Now remember, this thing didn't have this, doesn't have a specific safety listing. So there's a look at our safety capacitor, suppression capacitor across the two sides, primary to secondary. It's got the UL logo on it. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a rated capacitor. So the Spigen power adapter is using a IP2726 chipset. This has a couple of features that are I don't know about because the, the data sheet isn't accessible. But we can see a couple of tracks that run across and connect between these two chips. So there is some kind of communication happening between these chips and allowing them to decide what's happening, basically. These chips also have two built-in MOSFET drivers, and these down here are N-channel MOSFETs, with this being the drain and this being the source. And all four of these are connected that same way. So these both have control from this, and this has like a charge pump in it, so it can drive these N-channel MOSFETs to more positive than the supply rail, which is required to be able to turn these on all the way. So there's positive voltage coming in here, which is going to supply this up to here. So that's going to stop. And then we have positive voltage coming in over here. This is from this half of the power supply. That's going to come in, go to here, and stop. If this USB port, so if USB port 1 needs to turn on, it's going to turn this MOSFET on and supply power to here. If this USB port decides it needs more than 50 watts, it's going to turn on these two MOSFETs down here, which is going to allow all of the voltage and current power from this power supply to be connected over to this side. So this USB port will be on. It can also turn this MOSFET off, so now this USB port gets no power. These four MOSFETs down here are how they're doing the power sharing between the two power supplies. Because as we saw on the bottom of this thing, it's essentially two separate power bricks and they need to be linked together somehow. So we don't know exactly what this IP2726 chip is doing, but it has some kind of data between these two that it can make the decision of which one of these gets all of the power. Okay, here's our control chip. This is taking our smooth DC voltage from this side. So we have DC, HV, and it's driving the transformer primaries. On this side over here, this is our secondary from the transformer. That's going through this MOSFET here and charging this capacitor. Over here, we have a current sense resistor, which is being used to tell basically that protocol chip, which is up on the other board, whether or not it needs to turn on. And here we have the negative connection, which is going to both of the USB ports. This is the positive connection from this power supply which is going through this circuitry over here and getting to here. And this is what's going into those four MOSFETs on the other board. 
The exact same thing is happening on this side. We have that positive connection coming in, going to here, going to the other USB ports. They share the negative connection. So essentially what we have is these two controller chips are separately controlling the two USB ports and optionally they can be bridged together to make one USB output of double the power. This isn't an ideal design because if the voltage is slightly different on one versus two, current is going to flow between these two but I guess they took that into consideration and there must be some way of sharing control between these two. Although I don't see any traces traveling across the board between these two devices. So it looks like they really operate independently and that protocol chip on the other board is making the decisions. We did see that in a, from a power quality perspective for a 100 watt power adapter, this was lower class. This is the bottom of the range for the 100 watt power adapters as of right now for anything I've seen so far. If this even scored lower than some of the 65 watt power adapters. So this approach that they use with very, very large input capacitance and two separate power adapters kind of glued together uh, doesn't lead to great power quality. Are we getting down layers of tape yet? All right, so next we're gonna have our secondary winding. We can see they maintained isolation all the way through. So this is sleeved, sleeved, looks like about six turns. So this wire in here is, is sleeved more than once. So this has both an insulation on it and then it's also a, uh, you know, your regular copper wire inside there. And then at the ends when it leaves the transformer, it actually had two layers of insulation. So yeah, overall the transformer doesn't look bad. You know, I don't see anything wrong. You know, they had good isolation between the different windings. Uh, it's kind of a, Destructive teardown to get all these bits out and I definitely turned this into a pile of dust All right. Well, thanks for watching. Hopefully you learned a little something in this video And if you like to see teardowns of power adapters, let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll keep going and hopefully we can do one that has got a little bit more Technology in it. This one was kind of kind of boring. It's just it's just two power adapters glued together, right? So Okay, thanks for watching. See you in the next one